Good afternoon. My name is Ray Tsuchiyama. I am hosting or guesting, as we say, for Jay Fidel on a beautiful, balmy day in Honolulu. We have a great backdrop of sky and sea that we'll be talking about a lot more of, with our two guests. And they're from the University of Hawaii, uh, U.S. Carnegie One Research University, with lots and lots of research topics going on. And one of them is dealing with the ice and what its implications are for society in the future. And we have guest Professor uh, Chris Measures. And uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. For and we, ha we have Dr. Mariko Hatta, Hi. who is a researcher at uh, the University of Hawaii in this area. And tell me, Chris, what department do you belong to and what's it, what it does? Well, we're uh, both members of the oceanography department. I'm a teaching faculty member. Uh, Mariko is a researcher, as she can explain herself. And uh, we've been working together for more than a dozen years now, and we do active research at sea. We go out on ships, collecting samples, making measurements in near to real time on the ship to help inform how our sampling strategies will continue during the, the research cruise, you know, wherever that happens to be. So you're really in the trenches <laughs> dealing with the sea uh, in, in your day-to-day uh, -day world as, we're, uh, as well as research. You're out there uh, all over the place. Where, where would you say you've spent the most amount of time? Or what, what ocean or, what, or have you been everywhere? I've been everywhere. Okay. <laughs> I, it's hard to say, but I mean, yes, I mean, the data is out in the ocean, so we have to go out there to get it. I okay. mean, if you want to know about the world, you have to go and sample it. And Dr. Hatta, uh, where, uh, where are you from and what university did you take your PhD? So I'm graduated from University of Toyama, which is inside Japan and like middle part of Japan, like beautiful coastal side and mountain side. And how long have you been at University of Hawaii? That's about 11 years. Okay, so, so uh, here you are together, and what is the topic? What, what is the, uh, I guess, uh, I sense an urgency from you, uh, Chris and, and, and uh, Mariko, about what's happening in the ice that seems to suggest something. What is that uh, going on? Uh, in, and, and why is the ice so important to understand uh, in, in uh, really uh, projecting or what we see as history of climate change? Well, the, the ice is very important. I mean, we, we could go back a bit further to see how this project first uh, okay. evolved. But, but just to answer your question directly, uh, one of the things that people who are in, interested in understanding climate and the history of climate on the planet is we now know that the high latitude regions are the ones that will respond first hmm. towards climate change, and so. And why is why why is that? In, uh, as the, as the you know, Earth is a round orb. What what why does it happen first or uh, something at the top? You know, that's a good question. Oh. I'm not sure I'm qualified <laughs> to actually answer that properly, and so I don't want to give a okay. false answer. But basically, the high latitude areas are more susceptible to warming. Okay. And of course, you know, once you have the phase change from ice to water, I mean, that is a big change right. in terms of the properties of the surface of the Earth. But if we go back a bit further, the, the project that we're going to talk about today, the Arctic, was actually just one of several of a big, large international project that was started about, I want to say about 14 years ago. We had an international meeting in Toulouse, France, where a lot of trace element scientists, we're, we measure trace elements on the right. ship. Now, trace elements are not of much interest to most people because basically, you know, they don't even know what they are and why should they care. But we use them as traces of processes in the ocean. So they're like dyes. I like okay. to, you know, and they have different colors. So we can look at the ocean and we can envisage the processes that cause the distribution of trace elements if we understand them properly. So about 12 years ago, a group of us got together to put together a big international program mm. called Geotraces. There were 20 of us wrote a science plan which then went out for international review by large numbers of bodies and then we got comments back and we finalized it and it was finally approved by the IGBP which is a big international global biosphere program 
And we started the program with, I think, probably about 10 countries involved, and now we have about 28 countries wow. involved. We produced a science plan, mm -hmm. and uh, we now have cruise tracks around the world which are to look at the distribution of trace elements <laughs> in many different areas, covering different hydrographic and biological regimes to understand how those distributions come about and how we can use them as traces of process, not only in the ocean today, which of course they are, but also those signals are recorded in the sediments. So by carefully looking at sedimentary concentrations, we can go back and look at how the ocean was long before there were any oceanographers or even any people. Uh, sediments meaning uh, at the bottom of the ocean, right? Yes, the earth yes. or wh whatever, yeah, and, and all the, the clams and so forth kind of right. <laughs> well, disposed. Well, in the deep ocean, there's no clams. Well, clams, but, but, but you, yes, there's a lot of things that come down yes, and then kind of yes. have a whole yes. uh, uh, history of yes. what's been happening. Yes. Oh, great. And the sediments record the uh, history of the planet going back millions of years, if you can go down deep enough. And that's similar to uh, scientists uh, doing cores in the ice. Am I correct? Yeah. How was the uh, um, you know uh, trace elements or uh, what percentage was oxygen or carbon dioxide? Yes, you yes. know, uh, hundred thousand years yes, ago, kind yeah, of thing. The Vostok yeah, ice core. Right. Yeah, it's a very similar thing. Okay. And, and again, it's because of a, a, an accumulation bit by bit over time. And once you understand how that works and you can date it, then you can go back and start looking at how the planet has changed over time. Shall we go to the first slide or? Um, yeah, we could show okay. uh, one of the slides up there, which actually uh, I'll talk you through those. Okay. We didn't put them to. Oh, so this is actually an example of right. uh, this is um, the cruise tracks of the Geotraces oh. program. All the ones that are in black are the ones that we've already okay. taken. Yeah. Right. So different countries are doing different cruises. No one country can afford to do So that. there's a lot at the top and some yes. at the bottom, right? A little right. bit at the bottom. Right. right, and so actually the ones you see there in uh, yellow, these right. are the ones that the U.S. Right. occupied. Oh, okay. But France, Germany, there are 28 countries putting their resources into right. this. In fact, the one in red in the middle that you right. see is actually the one that's uh, planned for 2018. Wow. And actually, Mariko is now the PI on this grant. Oh. She just found out she was funded okay. a few weeks well, ago congratulations. by National Science Foundation. Yeah. So she's going to be the boss. You know, it on. looks like the uh, uh, dateline. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. Oh, 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 well, it's oh. meant to go down. So, it's not on the dateline, but it's meant to so go I down. I passed the dateline and had to wear a funny hat. <laughs> <laughs> well, King, yeah. King Neptune was there. All yeah. right. Well, okay. We usually do that on the yeah. Arctic and right. Antarctic okay. and the equatorial <laughs> crossings. <laughs> so I have been on the ship. Uh, so first uh, slide, you want the next one? Yeah. Well, let's okay. have a look. Um, okay. All right. So okay. this is actually the cruise tracks that we had in the Arctic. Wow. And, and we were actually doing this with other countries. So Canada and Germany, as you can see, and the USA. Oh. Actually, at one point, Spain wanted to be involved in Norway, but they could not get oh. funding for their cruises. But we divided up the Arctic into uh, these different sections so that we could all on the same year get samples, right. compare our data together, and then we will get a picture of the whole Arctic. So there's some on the fringes, I guess, yes. uh, of the Arctic uh, uh, center of the North Pole, and, and some right at the, uh, at, at the, the North, North Pole. Pole. Yeah. yeah. So so when I look at this, uh, Chris, uh, you can chime in. Uh, the no North Pole and, the, and the, the highest point of our uh, planet is not, there's no Earth. It's no. just water. It's just water. And ice. Am yes. I correct? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, and Greenland is a big island with rocks and you know, right. it's yeah. Earth, right? Uh, but it's covered by uh, by ice. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Right. So the Arctic is covered by ice usually in the winter, and then that ice melts oh. again in the summer. We'll come back to that right. maybe later right. when we look at the uh, how that's changed. Who, who owns the Arctic? Ah, that actually <laughs> we had a good talk at the Urals yeah. meeting not long ago. The law of the sea is very complicated yes. here, and uh, the w it was very badly written oh. by lawyers who don't know uh, much about <laughs> our sciences. Yeah. And it's quite possible that the Russians could lay claim Whoa. to most of the Arctic based on the way the law of the sea was written. Yeah. And that might mean that no other country will get in there to do oceanography in wow. the future. Well, that's, that's bizarre. But that they, do, but they do have uh, uh, some uh, um, Spitsbergen and some islands well, up there, but they're very close to the Arctic. I mean, that's Russian territory, am I correct? Right. Well, Spitsbergen actually is run between Norway and oh. Russia. That's actually a cohabitation. Oh. <laughs> there used to be a lot of coal mining there. Yeah. Oh. I almost got there once, but my <laughs> ship I was getting on got stuck. That's another story. Anyway, it's a All right, story. another slide. Go ahead. 
Well, this tells us a little bit about how the Arctic works. So one of the reasons for having an expedition to the Arctic is it's a very unusual ocean compared to the others. And why? Because it's covered with ice. Right. So you form ice every winter, and then that ice melts in the summer, and it gives you a layer of fresh water on the surface. And when you get fresh water on the surface of the ocean, you can no longer make deep water, hmm. which means you can't sink water right. from the surface. So when we stop doing that, the whole circulation of the Arctic right. will change right. completely differently. Be from because, what it is as today. I understand, there's a, 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 um, a movements of great rivers of deep water that go along the ocean that has a lot of effect on climate. The uh, uh, ocean circulation is r incredibly important to climate. Uh, you know, we know some of the connections, but there are many we do not. Mm -hmm. And we know that if that changes, of course, the day after tomorrow was a classic example of a science fiction. Right, right, sort right. Of, uh, completely it, wrong, of yeah. course, in terms <laughs> of science, it was fiction. But what if, you know, uh, there are, uh, why certain regions of uh, the north, uh, um, northern Europe is warmer yes. because of the circulating of the current, stream. the Gulf Stream. Yeah. The, the, exactly. And, yeah, and so there are benefits to uh, these currents uh, for, for mankind. Absolutely, and I think as we were talking earlier, I mean, what, there was a global period of, uh, there was a, a mini ice age right. starting around 1350, but before that was relatively warm, and that was, of course, when the Vikings managed right. to settle Greenland right. and actually engage in agriculture there, which right. you cannot do today. Yeah. Uh, but as soon as it got cold again, they were forced out of Greenland, and in fact, their uh, their adventurous journeys pretty much yeah, came to an end. Very, very sad. Uh, any, any, uh, the next slide, please. Oh, well, this is something we were going to talk about: was the actual change in the ice uh, uh, that we find at oh. the North Pole. So I was there in 1994 as part of a different expedition mm -hmm. with. Uh, a Canadian ship and a, an American ship, and actually in the foreground is a Russian ship, Whoa. the Yamal. So we actually had three ships together at the Whoa, North Pole. Wow. I don't think that's ever happened before. Now, to or get soon. to the North Pole, it's like uh, uh, icebreakers, right? Yes. You have yeah. to go yeah. there yeah. and create yeah. your own road. <laughs> kind yes, of. basically you have yeah. to break the ice, yeah. and uh, it can be very thick in times right. because the ice flows actually raft together. Yeah. They get jam jumbled up on top of each other. It's very hard for a ship well. to break through. But well, if, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. But if you look at the bottom of that slide... Can we go back see, to the slide? Yeah. yeah. What you see, this is when uh, Mariko and I were up there on, in uh, September 2015, open water wow. at the yeah. North Pole. And, and we'll go back to the slide and the evolving conditions of the North Pole after this break. Okay. okay. Good. One minute. Yes, I remember, of course, the tragedy of the Shackleton. Oh, oh, yeah, oh. Shackleton. Shackleton, uh, Shackleton. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, the Endeavor. Right. I mean, that was, you know, what a leader. <laughs> yeah. What a man. I mean, uh, he got all these people out. Uh, but uh, remember the ship, and those was all broad, and, and the yeah. ice and, and would crush the, uh, yeah. the wood. But the Fram, you know, yeah. I've seen that in Oslo. Mm. The Fram was... Uh, Ten seconds. My name is Ray Tsuchiyama. We are back in the middle of an exciting discussion on conditions in the, in the north of the world, which has a lot of lessons. It has a lot more uh, insights to climate. And through researchers like Chris Measure and uh, Mariko Hata, we are discovering a lot more on how uh, we understand uh, all these things happening in the ice and oceans. So I'll go back to another s the slide uh, that we have, or you want to move to a new one? Well, right we now. could just finish by okay. looking at... Uh, Can we have the last slide up, uh, please? Great. Yeah, so you can see that when we were there that we had a, lo a lot of open water. Wow. In fact, we made it to the North Pole much faster wow. than we expected. We were on a Coast Guard vessel this time, the U.S. Right. Coast Guard vessel hmm. Healy, and for them, of course, getting to the North Pole is the main goal. Right. For us, it's the sampling on the way. <laughs> 
But we ended up there much earlier than we expected because uh, September the 15th is normally the lowest ice oh. in the Arctic. And we aimed That's to be summer in, in, in the yes, Arctic. Summer. Right. Okay. Most of it is melted. Oh. But we were actually making eight knots sometimes wow. through the ice, which is almost unheard of. Now, a uh, little question. Um, if you are there and have a compass, what would the compass say? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's supposed to point down. Well, actually, no, because the, the magnetic North Pole is not at the North Pole. Oh, yeah. The oh. magnetic North Pole is in northern Canada. Oh, okay. I didn't know it's that. It's, it moves, south. right? It used to, yeah. like, it, the, uh, there was flippings of the poles in the there past, but we won't too, go into that. But <laughs> it's never actually been at the geographic North Pole. Okay, it, I got it. It's always it. been somewhere in northern Canada. But So your point by these photos is that there's been change up Huge north. Huge changes. That uh, you could make a trek or track uh, to the North Pole way faster than before and, yeah. and, and, and this is a um, unnerving moment because I always thought it was solid ice all the time. Yes, mm -hmm. well people of course are interested for shipping reasons yeah. to be able to ship across the right. pole. In fact the first time I was at the North Pole was the first time we accidentally were the first ships ever to go across the Arctic Ocean, surface wow. ocean. Wow. That's and, quite a that trip. was not intended yes, because yes. we had a ship problem. That's but, unbelievable. Yeah. But the Arctic is really like the Canary in the coal mine. Right, right. These okay. are the places that will see the changes first, and we're already seeing them. It's uh, next, next slide, please. So actually, it's not just the surface water that's uh, melting. I, I, I don't want to bore your uh, viewers with this, but we are looking at the temperature and salinity, that's the amount of salt in the water of uh, 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 all the samples we take. And we had someone on board from Scripps, who I, right. a good friend of mine who was also, he's been to the North Pole three times wow. actually. And uh, he was plotting the differences that we were seeing. And this mm. slide shows how much change between 1994 and 2015. Mm. So that's a pretty short period of time in terms of ocean circulation. Right. So Very we're, short. We're yeah. seeing things warming. You know, we're seeing whole bunches of changes, and they're hmm. all climatically related. Next slide, please. So this change in ice cover has actually been visible uh, for some time now, ever since satellites started measuring the ice. I mean, they can get very good measurements. It's very hard to do this sort of thing directly from the ship. But as you can see in, the, in that, this is the Arctic sea ice minimum coverage. So that's around September 15th. That's when we get it. And what you see is there's quite a lot of jiggles in that mm. line because there are many things affected. Right. But the direction, the trajectory of that line is unmistakable. And uh, we're seeing it. And actually, there are bets out there as to when the Arctic will be ice free in the summer. Mm. Some people are predicting within a few years. Mm. And that will be a massive change right. for the planet. So, uh, next slide, please. In fact, this is something that was published very recently, showing that, in fact, these were some people from uh, Germany and from the UK, showing that the reduction in sea ice, which you see on the left-hand side of that right figure, that's the amount of sea ice. and. Along the bottom axis is the uh, cumulative amount of CO2 that's been put into the atmosphere as a result of anthropogenic activity. And it's not a perfect correlation, but boy, it's really suggestive that essentially as we add CO2 to the atmosphere, we're reducing the amount of sea ice. So, so the question is um, that we always uh, historically have seen ice at the top of our world uh, in the Arctic. Is that a good thing? <laughs> or, uh, or that that there was ice, so that we have a better uh, uh, seasonal or you know uh, uh, climate for people to grow crops and you know live in temperate zones and so forth. Or what will it mean if there was no ice at the top for longer periods? It, you know, I mean that's a good question because. We, we live in this world now. We built our infrastructure to deal with the, the planetary temperatures we have. Yeah. And when we start to change it, then we will not be well suited to live on the planet and we will have to change. So one of the things I tell my students is the areas that have agriculture now, because they have enough rain and good temperatures, also have railroad lines and roads going to them. 
you move agriculture into the middle of northern Saskatchewan, right. there are no railroad lines. That's right. There that's are no right. roads. The, you're what you call them, uh, well, the what you're saying, yeah, it's, it's a, uh, a, a transportation infrastructure, yes. how to get crops to people who eat them, <laughs> to yeah, cities. Yeah, exactly. You know, we yeah. need to move stuff from farms yeah, to yeah. cities, and if we suddenly change the climate, that's mm. all going to change, and it will cost a huge amount of money to mm. rebuild that infrastructure. Next, next slide, please. Uh, is that the end? Or one oh, more? this one more. is actually to give us some kind of a warning. I don't know whether this will show up, but this is a GIF. And this was the Larsen B ice shelf right. that broke up in 2002. And, and this is in Antarctica. This not, is not Antarctica, in, Antarctica now, now, but, the, now, but Antarctica south. is affected by right. the temperature just as much as the Arctic. That broke up and surprised everybody because nobody expected hmm. it. And the reason was that satellites can see the ice on the surface, but they don't know how thick it is. And remarkably, we showed this for Science Cafe uh, a few weeks ago, and since then, Larsen C has now right. broken yeah. off, and this is an iceberg twice the size of Lake Erie. Yeah. So we are seeing this. This is happening before our very eyes. Some people, of course, wish to ignore this, yeah. but... Is, uh, how many slides we have more? That's or? it. Oh, that's it. Okay. Uh, so... Uh, so uh, Dr. Hatta, uh, you, you've been on the ships and so forth, just to give uh, kind of a personal kind of, uh, how, how is it on these ships? Uh, what kind of experience is it? Well, it's, I actually been to only research boats, so I don't really know about the real, like a vacation type of right, right, boat. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> Like a princess like, cruise you're talking yeah. about, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's like a, we are generally, like a, a, particularly this cruise, I being on the ship for two and a half months wow. without any port. Right. So it's the first two weeks we can have a fresh product, right. fresh vegetables right, right, and yogurt right. and yeah. this kind of thing. But after two weeks, we don't have any Right, water. right, right. So, so how many people on the, on the, on the oh, ship? Oh, yeah. So it's like a, this cruise was 150 people, right. and 50 people are scientists, and 100 is a Coast Guard. I got it. I got it. So, so the fifty scientists all are doing experiments day and night. Or what? What, yes. what is the uh, um, schedule like? Yes, a day and night, and depend on the when is cast. These are three big different group. One right. is uh, collecting water, right. collecting oh. particle, which right. is some small like a um, bio biological particle or some sedimental particle, and core, which is the sediment that right. we are talking about in the bottom ocean. So uh, two and a half months is very long time to me <laughs> to be <laughs> on, a, on a boat with the same people all the time. Oh, yes. What did you miss the most uh, uh, you know, when you came, what you wanted to do when you came back to land? Was there anything? The first, well, it's a very comfortable oh. for in general speaking, but I really want to cook by myself. Ah, <laughs> right, right, right. So you missed your own ho home, home cooking. cooking. Okay, yes. it's like living in a dorm, I guess. Uh, uh, and uh, having uh, a yeah. beer. Yeah. Oh yeah, we there's no alcohol on it. Ah, because it's the Coast Guard, the Navy. No, no. actually, oh. even the research vessels oh. now have no alcohol. Oh, I, don't I didn't know, know that. why they decide. Well, it's, that, it's as you know, the U UK Royal Navy has a rum uh, oh, ration, yes, yes. so that's a that's tradition how they there. Got people to fight, <laughs> get them drunk first. So <laughs> we're coming to the end, and and. Um, uh, you shown us um, some, you know, uh, scientific data, okay? Mm. Uh, s some evidence uh, that changes are happening at the Arctic and Antarctic. Uh, what would you want the person on the street in Hawaii or in the globe to take away from this? I think the most important lesson is that everywhere we look on the surface of the Earth, we are seeing the climate of the planet changing at a dramatic rate. That is taking us into the unknown in some circumstance. I mean, the, the climate of the planet has been hot in the past, but it didn't have seven billion people living on it trying to feed themselves. So this is really a very urgent problem. And as someone at Scripps, I think, uh, made a, a very good analogy. If you go to the, yeah, and this is all related to CO2, of course, which some people just don't want to believe, but basically, if you go to your doctor and he tells you you have to lose 20 pounds in 20 months, if you do it a pound a month, it's feasible. If you don't do anything and you're after 19 months, you've got to lose 20 pounds, you're never going to do it. Right, right. And this is the problem with climate. Right. If we don't do something now, it will become harder and harder until it's impossible 
to change the trajectory, and that's and, very scary. And in a very substantial way, what do we have to do as a society, as an industrialized society? We have to learn to live in the most uh, sustainable manner we can. It's not possible to not affect the environment, but we have to minimize those effects, particularly the ones that we think are most dangerous. CO2 is one that is actually relatively easy to avoid. I mean, it's just a question of money and finding our power from other places. Use, use the fossil fuels for making plastics. That's actually a very good use of them. But burning them for energy is a very poor use, and it's dangerous. Well, we're coming to the end, and I must thank you both for giving your insights. I'm reminded of when I was working for MIT, the experiences of uh, Mario Molina, oh, yes, professor, yeah. who proved that it was a hole uh, yes. uh, uh, created by fluor uh, fluorocarbons, um, uh, refrigerators, and yeah, so forth. Yeah, the, and, and, and the CFCs. And the CFCs, and they took a dramatic step of ending CFCs. Yes. <laughs> and it's taking 50 years to recover from oh. that. And, and, but, but we that, have, we are but that's a, that, But that is a case study yes. that uh, science and data did cha change policy and, uh, yes. you know, in a society. And so, so it can happen. Uh, yes. Uh, and I think what you need, what we need more is people like yourselves to carry out a scientific case to our leadership, government leadership, and, and industry and business, because this is not just one-sided. It's a whole society kind of a movement, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, but we do need them to understand that science is the truth. It's not a political issue. Scientists right. are not politicians. We search for the truth, and we are not making this stuff up. Right. Well, science is, is to understand the yes. world. That, that that's is the, that that's is the our goal. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, on uh, Research in Manoa. And again, uh, we thank you for bringing ThinkTech in Hawaii.